Member statements. I recognize the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Over the last year, housing has been top of mind for my constituents. At best, COVID-19 has given us the time to reflect on what matters when it comes to where we live and work. But I've heard from countless constituents who are concerned with a runaway real estate market. In Kitchener-Waterloo, for instance, the average price of a home is now $900,000. All levels of government need to work together on this to ensure that everyone can afford a safe and welcoming home. At its worst, the pandemic has shown us that there are too many people in our province who don't have access to affordable or safe housing. That's why I was impressed to see the, the, the announcement earlier this week for the construction of 41 supportive housing units for women experiencing or at risk of homelessness. The project is a collaboration between the Kitchener-Waterloo YWCA, the City of Kitchener, the Region of Waterloo and the Federal Government. The Federal Government has provided the funding. The City of Kitchener has provided a $1.50 year lease to the Region and the YWCA, who will ultimately provide the support of housing units. Elizabeth Clark, the ED, says this project will take a big chunk, almost a third of the women who are on chronic homeless housing waiting lists. About 100 women in the region who are without homes are waiting for a place to live, she said. Most of them are living in the YWCA's shelter in downtown Kitchener. I hope all of us in this house can reflect on the need for housing in our constituency and the value of doing the right thing, prioritizing more affordable housing projects across this province. Thank you very much. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Eglinton-Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker. Over the weekend, the Jewish community in Eglinton-Lawrence and across Ontario began the observance of Passover, one of the most significant holidays in the Jewish calendar. Passover commemorates the story of the Israelites' departure from ancient Egypt. To everyone cele celebrating, I wish you a Chag Pesach Sameach. Happy Passover. In Canada, those celebrating typically hold or attend seders on the first two nights of the eight days of Passover, surrounded by close friends or extended family. Unfortunately, for the second year in a row, most of those seders were far smaller than usual, as people opted to gather with their immediate families. Speaker, I also want to recognize that yesterday was Palm Sunday, the start of the Holy Week for Christians in my riding and across the province. This is the most solemn week of the church's liturgical year, and much like Passover, it once again looks very different than usual this year because of COVID-19. On a personal level, I am very grateful that these religious services, rites, and ceremonies can proceed this year in all areas of the province with reduced capacity and enhanced public health measures. While it's not exactly how we're used to celebrating things before the pandemic, it is a hopeful sign that we have come a long way since last March when we had much more severe public health restrictions in place. And I hope next year, regardless of which holiday you personally observe or celebrate, we can all once again do so safely and gather in person with our families and friends. Thank you. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Toronto, in my riding of Spadina, Fort York in particular, is known for world-famous world diversity, culture, and a vibrant music and entertainment scene. And that the heart of it all are our local restaurants, bars, live music venues, and our small businesses. Unfortunately, instead of fast-tracking COVID-19 testing and the vaccine rollout, this government has been acting as if lockdowns are the primary solution. While announcing these lockdowns, they have failed to provide what we have repeatedly called for, financial support for tenants, for, for small businesses, and for the workers they employ. As a result, in January, Statistics Canada estimated that 25,614 Ontario businesses have been forced to close. I spoke to Sarah Bailey, who runs a nonprofit called Full Plate that provides support to hospitality workers. She told me that many restaurant workers and bartenders have been unemployed for a full year, and many are facing food insecurity and forced to sign up for food boxes or grocery gift cards. Their mental health is being affected and their bank accounts are running dry. Danielle Bassett, a Toronto chef with 20 plus years in the industry, spent part of her youth living on the streets and is now using donations from shuttered restaurants to help contribute to social programs she once relied on. She says she has multiple friends in the restaurant sector who committed suicide in the last year because they lost their careers and businesses that took them years to, decades to build. 
This government must provide proper support, such as paid sick days, presumptive coverage for those who contract COVID-19 at the workplace, and rent supports for those whose incomes are affected, like the thousands of restaurants and my workers are trying to do in my riding. Thank you. Thank you. Member statements. Good morning, Member for Speaker, Whitby. I'm pleased to report that the Ability Centre in my riding was a recipient of $4.5 million last, uh, last week from the Ontario budget. Now, this investment speaker will help the Ability Centre serve more people in Durham Region through the expansion of its programs, services and partnerships. This strategic partnership-based approach will ensure speaker sustainable program and service delivery while providing model frameworks to support communities like Whitby and other adjoining municipalities to become autonomous and leveraging the values and benefits of accessibility and inclusion. Speaker, the Ability Centre supports the delivery of services across several Government of Ontario mandates to achieve the priorities of multiple ministries in a common framework with a focus on COVID-19 response and recovery. Speaker, I believe that in addition to providing more services and programs to Ontarians and, most importantly, residents in Durham, this investment in the centre will significantly enhance COVID-19 recovery efforts, resulting in sustained impacts in the years to come. Congratulations to the staff and the Board of Directors of the Ability Centre for the tremendous work, work they're doing in accessibility and inclusion of Durham Region residents. Thank you. Next, we have the member for Windsor Tecumseh. Speaker, I've told you before about our fantastic symphony orchestra in Windsor. While other symphonies had to lay off their musicians and close their doors during COVID, Windsor seized an opportunity to introduce young people to the magical sounds of a symphony orchestra. The WSO's associate conductor, Daniel Wiley, developed an education program. It was no easy undertaking, but the symphony's musicians, production team, and indeed the entire board of directors got behind the concept. Ten digital education programs were developed for grades K to 6, and another 12 hours of content were created for the senior grades from 7 to 12. These concerts all followed established board curriculum. The symphony also put together four additional educational videos and speaker all programs included a virtual classroom visit from conductor Wiley or maestro Robert France. Speaker, nearly 70,000 students were educated and entertained from Windsor to Rainy River and Peterborough. The videos even made their way as far down as Texas. Across 10 school boards and 150 schools, students who otherwise may never have seen an orchestra had an opportunity to engage with classical music in a meaningful way. COVID placed many restrictions on all of us, but the Windsor Symphony found a way to enrich the lives of these students and indeed their teachers with this innovative presentation. For that, Speaker, I say well done, bravo, and many thanks from all of us here in Ontario's Provincial Parliament. Thank you. Member statements? The member for Ottawa, Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> I want to take the opportunity this morning to speak about the important issue of homelessness and affordable housing. The global pandemic has amplified shortfalls in our supply of affordable housing, especially for vulnerable populations. In Ottawa, there are 350 homeless families in motel rooms that cost $3,000 a month. A federal government commission report says the effect of the pandemic on homelessness in Canada could lead to a rise in homelessness by 10 to 15 percent in some cities, depending on what happens in the labor market. Now is the time to look at involving the support of new and non-traditional partners to provide much-needed social services and to integrate affordability in housing developments. To encourage a new approach and ensure a suitable and diverse housing supply, the government needs to step in and take the lead with an aggressive strategy. Private sector organizations, such as businesses and investors, should care more about housing and the contribution they can make in driving affordable supply. I've said it before, but I will say it again. In a province as prosperous as Ontario, everyone should have a place to call home. 
It's crucial that we start working together to implement innovative and sustainable solutions to homelessness before the aftermath of the pandemic forces more Ontarians into difficult circumstances. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Scarborough Agent Court. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the residents of Ontario faced very challenging year due to COVID-19 pandemic. Many experienced varieties of hardships. The residents of Scarborough Aging Court were no exception. Last year, many businesses, seniors, families, and nonprofit organizations had to endure unprecedented hardships. COVID also provide us with the opportunity to rediscover ourselves and the resilience of our community. Even though there were many heart-wrenching stories, there were also uplifting accounts of generosity, compassion, and thoughtfulness. Regardless of our background, we supported each other in many ways. I would like to pay tribute to some of the Scarborough Aging Court unsung heroes, such as Scarborough Health Network doctors, nurses, staff, custodians, and volunteers, 42nd Division officers, the management and the staff of Care First Seniors and Community Services Association, Aging Court Community Services Association, the Salvation Army Aging Court Church Food Bank, Chinese Professional Association of Canada, North American Muslim Foundation, Seniors Persons Living Connected, Chinese Cultural Center of Greater Toronto, Yihang Center for Geriatric Care, Monshang Foundation, Shepherd Village Seniors Community, Armenian Relief Society, Golden Maple Leaf Seniors Association, the Cross Cultural Community Service Association, Scarborough Seniors Chinese Association, Center for Immigrant and Community Services, Hong Fung, Mental Health Association, the Confederation of the Chinese Canadian Organization, the Chinese Community Center of Ontario, New Immigrants for Special Needs, Canada Confederation on Fujian Association, Scarborough Chinese Baptist Church, St. John Vint St. John's Vintage Garden, and last but not least, Villa Elegance. I am honored and proud to serve and represent an outstanding group of Scarborough Aging Court organizations and individuals. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> member Statements. The member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Premier made an announcement on Friday claiming that the government will build a new hospital in Brampton. When I looked at the 2021 budget, I saw the announcement for what it really is, just another election promise. Bramptonians have been struggling with a health care crisis since before the pandemic, and the city declared a health care emergency earlier last year. Despite this, the only mention of funding for Brampton's health care crisis was a $1.5 million planning grant and up to $18 million to expand Peel Memorial's urgent care centre to 24-7 operations. Brampton needs much more, Mr. Speaker. This, is, this extension promised by the Premier on Friday is not sufficient, nor is it a new hospital. Also, it does not start construction until 2023. What Brampton needs is for Peel Memorial to be converted into a full-fledged hospital, and we need another new standalone hospital. For one of the fastest-growing cities with more than 600,000 people, it is unacceptable that we only have one hospital with an emergency room. Brampton deserves its fair share, and it starts with more investment into our health care system, not empty election promises like we've had from previous Liberal and Conservative governments. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the recently tabled Ontario's Action Plan protecting people's health and our economy, the Government of Ontario has provisioned an absolute game-changer for taking care of our most vulnerable and at-risk seniors in Mississauga Centre. As a part of the Community Paramedicine for Long-Term Care program, which commits a new installment of $160 million to support the program in 33 communities across Ontario, $9.75 million in funding is directed to the region of Peel Paramedic Services. 
This funding is the next step in revolutionizing care provisions with a more coordinated, accessible, and home-based care model for seniors within reach. With this investment, paramedics in the Peel region and Health Ontario teams will collaborate more efficiently to resolve uh, current problems for seniors in terms of long-term care. This commitment of almost $10 million will lead to more uh, uh, better supports in their own home. Uh, so that they're not need to be placed in long-term care beds. Long-term care bed waiting lists will decrease and provide another option for our seniors to get the care that they deserve. To the men and women in paramedicine that bravely continue to fulfill their duties in Mississauga and across Ontario, as they have throughout this pandemic, we salute you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The next statement, the member for Mississauga Malton. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, a rising threat posing a serious threat for consumers and employees at Ontario Gas Station is 100% preventable crime of gas and dash thefts. In 2019 alone, there were 37,000 cases skyrocketing from a mere 9,200 thefts in 2010. That is over 100 cases of gas thefts a day and rising. Mr. Speaker, in the past, there are many incidences where workers chasing cars, getting hurt, and even lost lives to avoid dog pay and unnecessary yet common practice in Ontario, though they don't have to. These vulnerable workers, many times, some of them are new immigrants, often feel morally obligated to catch these fleeing criminals. This also poses risk to innocent bystanders and adds up work to our police officer. Mr. Speaker, we have a choice and we can avoid these risks. My private member Bill 231, unanimously supported by all members, will decisively address all these issues of community safety by making prepayment at gas station a requirement. BC and Alberta has already implemented prepayment and has avoided these risks for their resident. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank Ontario Convenience Stores Association, Ontario Association of Chiefs, and all members of this legislature for supporting Bill 231. Together, let's make our community safer and induce further trust in our system. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I want to thank the members for their eloquent statements this morning and uh, remind them that the standing orders allow us to have 90 seconds for our individual statements, and if we could plan that accordingly.